Welcome everybody uh, to the it, It's Lit uh, panel uh, discussion this afternoon, which we're, I'm delighted to say is including two of my favourite writers, Maura Fowley-Doyle and Helen Corcoran. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you both. I know this is a really strange format, and I personally would much prefer to be sitting around a table chatting to you and sipping coffee with the ability to go for a walk afterwards or something. And uh, it is really weird, isn't it? I still haven't gotten used to it, no matter how much um, I do these online sessions. But it's it's certainly better than not being able to do it at all. So I think that's something that really cheers me up and, and reassures me. And also because you, know, you guys have books out either just before lockdown, in your case, or, uh, and I think during lockdown, Helen, your book came out. Yeah. So I think that um, it's really important for us to have arenas in which you can share and discuss and connect with readers who um, might already have read your books or might be interested in reading them in the future. So we'll try not to have spoiler alerts, but I have so many questions to ask you both about the stories, about your writing, and about this idea that uh, uh, Mila gave to me, uh, which she thought would be kind of a good umbrella concept to explore your writing, and that is the issue of redefining labels. And before I ask you guys to start, um, and to read your pieces from your book and books and talk about your books. Um, I thought I'd, I'd ask a question around that first. But first, I want to introduce you formally so that everybody knows who we're talking to here. Um, my name is Sarah Moore Fitzgerald. I'm based in the University of Limerick, where I teach with um, wonderful colleagues like Lucille O'Connor and Donna Ryan, Gavin McRae and uh, Rob Doyle and, and others. Um, and we, we teach the MA in creative writing and we run a number of different creative writing programs. I'm also a novelist. Um, and here I am so thrilled to welcome Helen Corcoran. Uh, Helen grew up in Cork, Ireland, um, dreaming of stealing queens and dashing lady nights. And actually, you know something? When you read her book, uh, Queen of Coin and Whispers, you'll know that she's been thinking about this for a long time, that these uh, characters and ideas have probably been with her for the long haul because there's such a kind of rich, complex texture to both the characters and to the story that it doesn't surprise me to discover that she decided to become a writer at the age of eight. Um, apparently her mother and father were not that uh, thrilled about it or think or maybe that they were, it wasn't that they were not that thrilled, they thought it was a transient thing that's gone on for a long time. So she is a writer now and has always been a writer, I would say. After graduating from Trinity College Dublin, she worked as a bookseller for over a decade, which is the capacity in which I had the pleasure to meet her uh, when my first book came out. She lives in Dublin, she writes fantasy novels, and uh, she haunts coffee shops in search of the perfect latte. I don't know how much scope there is to do that now. No. But when you find the perfect latte, I want you to tell me where you found it. And um, this is her wonderful book. It's called Queen of Coin and Whispers. Um, I know it so well that I refer to it just as Queen, so I, I am on the fir on first name terms with this wonderful book, and I'm dying to talk to Helen about some of the ideas that are contained in the book, some of the things that have inspired her to write, a bit about her writing process, and also this idea of um, redefining labels. So, Helen, you're just so welcome, and uh, you. hope you're feeling as comfortable as you can be under the circumstances. My second guest is Maura Fowley Doyle, whose name itself feels like a poem to me. Um, she's half French, half Irish, um, and she, her first novel um, was the very uh, excitedly received The Accident Season, um, which reminded me from the very start of the kind of modern day version of fairy tales. Like the, I mean, The Sleeping Beauty comes into mind almost straight away, trying to save people from a curse that uh, is almost um, unavoidable, that is unavoidable. Um, her second book was welcomed with the same kind of excitement called Spell Book of the Lost and Found, with again, many accolades. And her most re recent book, um, I had the pleasure of being shortlisted with her last year uh, on uh, for her uh, in the Irish Book Awards. And that's the, her latest book, All the Bad Apples, um, which is, another extraordinary book that I'm going, and that's the one we're going to focus on today. Uh, Maura is also one of the contributors to Stripes Books Proud Anthology 2019, which was compiled by Juno Dawson. How are you both? How are you doing? 
Yeah, thank you. So it was a strange format, it takes some getting used to, but it's really lovely to be here to be able to have these chats. Like you said, like it's great that literary events don't just stop because we can't do them in person. Exactly. It's really, really important. And in fact, we're discovering whole new ways of reaching people, which is fantastic as well. So you can both hear me OK and you can see me and each other all right and everything is going all right. So if any, if there's any problem, we have Alex, the um, knight in shining armour in the background, who's going to rescue us if uh, anything goes wrong or anything trips up. Um, look, I want to go uh, to Moira first. Um, and actually, well, actually, why don't I just throw this out to both of you and we'll ask Maura to answer first and then Helen. And this is the paradox when we're talking about redefining labels, when we want to create literature that represents the diversity of the world, you know, and, and it's so lovely to know that we've moved on from kind of um, expecting to find only white middle class heroes with two parents um, who are straight and able bodied and who live in particular kind of socioeconomic backgrounds. It's wonderful to see that. We don't really need to assume that anymore. And yet, there's something about representing diversity that I think gives all us writers a little bit of a dilemma. And that is, we want to normalize diversity on one hand. We want to normalize the fact that there are same-sex relationships and that somebody might be in a wheelchair or, you know, um, their skin might be a different color, or they we might we might ha they might have different socioeconomic experiences than other characters, and yet at the same time we don't want to be glib about the real um, the real sort of challenges that they face. So, for example, I've heard Helen talking about this. You know, we want to have gay characters in books, uh, but they don't always we don't always want to be making a big deal out of that. We want to say this is normal. This is the way you know life is. This is who people are, and yet. As I remember Helen mentioning once, and it's so true that if you're gay, you have to come out almost every day sometimes because uh, you, you almost have to, you feel the pressure to declare yourself. So I suppose I'm asking in a very roundabout way, how, when you're representing diversity in your novels, do you manage that paradox, normalizing it on one hand, but also recognizing real challenges for people um, who have certain demographics on the other? Helen, do you want to... to Make a stab at that first. Yeah, um, I think I think it's important to represent diversity while also being really careful about the stories that you tell about them. It's one thing to include diverse characters in your work versus focusing on stories with marginalised pain. And that was something I focused on with Queen because I knew that there would be queer because I knew there would be characters of colour. But I was very careful what story I was telling with those with those characters. So I think it's that fine line of where you get to draw that line of where you get to tell the story and what kind of story is yours to, is yours to tell. Yeah, it's a real dilemma and there's a huge issue around appropriation, which is really concerning for writers because on one hand, you everybody has this real responsibility to represent different experiences, you know, with respect and with accuracy and with regard. Um, and yet, uh, you know, we, there's also this, um, this question about when, when that can be overstepped and what kind of fine lines we're, we're all walking on. Um, but yeah, Helen, I think it's really interesting. How, how about you, Maura? How do you manage that in the context of the stories that you write? Um, yeah, like I fully agree with Helen. Um, I'm a big believer in, uh, on the one hand, staying in my lane, because um, I'm very aware that I'm middle class, able bodied, white cis woman. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I don't want all of my characters to be middle class, able bodied cis girls uh, or women. Um, for me, the my main characters, especially, uh, I didn't, I suppose, set out to write diversely. Um, I just uh, I just wrote a story. Basically, uh, I'm quite a, a selfish writer in that I usually write to my teenage self. Uh, I write the books that I wanted to read as a teenager. Um, and so, uh, like, having been a queer teenager in Ireland, I kind of, that's, that's what I wanted to read. And so that's just naturally what gets written. Um, like, 
And I agree with you. And I think you were saying that, yeah, Helen was saying before as well, that um, I'm not focusing on uh, on pain or on like issue fiction. Uh, for my first two novels, I very much didn't, I very much wanted to write queer characters who uh, were just, who are, I suppose, cursed because they weren't, not, not cursed because they were gay, but cursed because they were cursed. Um, or who were like living this sort of magic realist, um, horror adjacent story. Um, and I never thought I would write a coming out scene or a coming out story, which is what I did with the third, with my third book, because that's just the way it had to happen. And it's, there needs to be space for coming out stories as well. Uh, but we've definitely, definitely moved beyond uh, that being the only narrative that queer characters get to have. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. the only narrative that certain characters get to have. And um, in my second book, I wanted to have a character, and I did. I do, do have a character because uh, he, he's a a boy in, and he's in a wheelchair. And my editors kept saying, "We need to know the story of why he's in the wheelchair." And while that story is there, I was going, "I don't want that to be." his story i want him to be a kid who just happens to be in a wheelchair and really to normalize it and there it was amazing because the response i got from a lot of kids who use wheelchairs after that book came out was so sort of it was so stunning to me that they had so rarely come across a story that normalized who they were and that reflected their experience in a way that didn't make a big deal out of it that just gave them a character with the same three-dimensional um, characteristics as everybody else so it's very interesting not giving that that's exactly the thing though um, and I think it's you guys both you two both capture it really well in your writing is just not making it the story just you know um, because the story is always that kind of wonderful multi-dimensional multi-layered thing no matter who you are um, and who you know your demographics are just part of that almost like an integral part but not the, not always the main focus. The other thing I always find really interesting about both your writing is you've both tackled this, and that is the two perspectives or the multi perspectives. So I always think writing a story from two different points of view or more than two uh, makes for all sorts of narrative possibilities, but also lots of complexities. So this is, I think, a technique question. I, I maybe I'll go to Helen first because. You know, your two characters are, are strongly in my mind when I think about this. How did you approach that? With a lot of naivety, which I think is the only way I got this done. Um, if I'd known how hard it was going to be, I just wouldn't have done it. Um, it came up a lot in feedback of drafts um, because it was a, it turned out to be a much more structural thing than I'd actually realized because I just thought, well, I needed both of them because they're not telling each other things which they need, but which also the reader needs to know. And at one point I got feedback of, well, maybe do the first half through the second half with um, Zanias. I tried that for 20,000 words and then I had to scrap it all because there was things the reader and I needed to know in Zania's point of view early on that she isn't just going to tell Leah because she has no idea she can trust her. Um, revising it turned out to be really hard because I tried to keep the pattern going. And if there was one thing I could change, it would be probably not stick so rigidly to the back and forth pattern. But I also wanted to keep that pattern so when I, when I break it, the reader knows that there's a big reason why. But when I had to revise then, I had to keep that pattern going. So I'd be left with, you know, Zanya needed like a chapter, but I'd had to cut her chapter. So then I had to figure out, did I push two of Leah's ch chapters together? And I think I have survivor's bias and I don't want to put anyone off, but it, it was a real challenge. Like nothing I've written since that book has, has been that technically hard. Um, and then oh, it was getting the political intrigue right and it, keeping it within that framework as well. So it was just, I think the fact that I went in not really realizing how hard it was going to be was was pretty much the only way I, I started writing it. So. Oh, Helen, that is so funny because I remember getting twisted up exactly the same tangle in my second book. I had the wisdom just to do a really simple 
sequential narrative for my first book, even though it involved time travel, it felt so much easier. And I got myself into, I just, I remember at one point with the second book, because I did exactly that same structure, just getting to the point, just throwing it aside and saying, it's broken, I can't do it, I don't know how I'm going to fix this. So I do completely appreciate the kind of, because it's so seamless and how brilliantly you've done it and how you've done that kind of, you know, how the reader knows things about one character that the other character doesn't know. It's so masterful, Ellen, but I can only imagine how uh, difficult an architectural job that was. I cried once, only once. There was one time I just tried, I just put, closed the laptop and went, I can't do, do this. But um, I had no real proper outline as well either. So I was doing this purely on my head and a few bullet points. Like I've learned so much in how to outline a book from from this and I think we'll talk about this later than during the writing process but I, I made everything so hard for myself I didn't need to <laughs> but I mean Helen what an apprenticeship as well because in many ways those difficulties and those challenges will stand to you as a writer so much like that if you can pull this off as a debut novel I'm only I can't imagine what you're going to do with uh, with future books so so exciting um Maura tell us about that because that's it strikes me most in your second one, the, the Spellbook of the Lost and Found, was really multi-perspective. So talk to us about the engineering task that had to go into that. Yeah, I, I, I also don't go in with a structure or a blueprint, and, and I suffer for it as well. Um, and especially like your characters, like Leah and Vanya's narratives are so kind of, so tightly linked. Like I have a lot of, uh, a lot of admiration, and I'm amazed you only cried once. Um, I cried many more times than once writing Spellbook. I was the hardest thing I've ever written. But um, and even so, like they're the the different uh, characters' perspectives are not quite as tight. Um, I, I'm not keep. I wasn't keep trying to keep the secrets as. Um, sort of as those kind of breaths between between sentences in the same in the same way as Queen. But um yeah, I um it was actually the the most challenging part, interestingly, uh wasn't so much the structure, even though I'm really not great at that. Um it was actually uh finding fi uh, finding their voices. Uh so uh Olive's voice um so there's it's written in trying to remember now three perspectives I have this problem where whenever I'm asked to read to talk about my books I have to reread sections of it so that I can remember what I've written um, and so I did that for all the bad apples but not for spell books so I'm just trying to remember my characters names here I have a really rubbish memory um but so uh spell book is uh split between um Olive Hazel and Laurel and uh Laurel gets fewer characters fewer um chapters uh, and Olive's voice I found straight away um, and Hazel just was difficult she didn't want to come to me she like just whatever the first I read so many drafts of that book the first few drafts um, was it was less about structure and more about me trying to find this character's voice and trying to figure out who she is how she relates to the world um, and what secrets she's keeping um, which is how I approach a lot of my characters. They just sort of, as I write, they tell me what the secrets they're keeping are and how that informs the the story, the narrative. Um, but she just was keeping her secrets real tight to her chest. Um, so yeah, then like structurally, actually, all that apples was more um, of, a, of an issue because I am really bad with timelines and dates and numbers. And there's a lot of dates and numbers and timelines and trying to sort of get family where you have to calculate the relative ages of people to their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents and what year everything it was there I'm not a natural structurer uh, so that was a challenge <laughs> but, and also for all the bad apples the dates are so important because they're so connected to the way the story unfolds so yeah I can imagine that being and I actually think a lot of writers are like that they're not good at the kind of those sort of almost like accounting fine needlework details. It's the big moments and it's the relationships and the dynamics. And that's where a lot of the creative energy goes. So it's hard to get all those little things right. And yet they matter so much as the story unfolds. Speaking of story, it's just lovely to hear you talk about your craft and the techniques and, and the challenges that you've encountered. But maybe now is a time, um, and I'll start start with Maura to, to ask you to, to focus on the, the latest book. Um, and just keep in mind that there's going to be viewers who are your fans who already have read 
the story, but also maybe people who are coming new to you and your stories. So uh, maybe just give a tiny little bit of background before you do your reading, just about which part of the story that, that you're reading. And uh, I think it's always such a pleasure and a privilege to hear the writer herself reading the, the words that she's written. So I can't wait to listen to you read your extract. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so this is all about apples, um, which is oh, it's already on the screen, which is the story of um, 17 year old Dina, uh, who sort of unwillingly comes out to her very conservative family um, on the same day that her older sister goes missing and is presumed dead. Uh, but the next day, Dina receives a letter, uh, supposedly from her sister, Mandy, um, which details a curse on the family uh, where each of the quote unquote bad apples of the family um, uh, on their 17th birthday, uh, if they have deviated from the sort of family's accepted norms, they are branded bad apples and terrible things happen to them. Uh, and Mandy says in this letter that she has uh, gone to try and break the curse uh, because she believes that it is now come to Dina uh, because Dina being gay has been branded a bad apple by her family. Um, and so what unfolds is a sort of um, uh, race against time road trip type of uh, experience where Dina being followed by these uh, banshees that herald this family curse tries to find her sister uh, before the curse comes to her and, and something terrible happens. Uh, so this extract is uh, in the third chapter and um, Dina is just uh, being quite badly bullied in school um, by classmates who have figured out that she's gay and are not uh, being very nice about it. Um, and she has gone to her sister to talk to her about this and her sister has told her about this curse and that she believes uh, that Dina is cursed, uh, which Dina takes to mean she's cursed because she's gay. Uh, and she basically leaves, she, uh, she leaves the school, she leaves her sister's house and uh, her best friend Finn is just, uh, has just come to to meet her. She's sitting down at um, in uh, the bay down in Clontarf in Bull Island, thinking about things. Uh, and her best friend has just arrived. Finn found me later, down past the beach by the wooden bridge. The rain had stopped, and the world was wrung out and blanketed in puddles. I was sitting on my jacket underneath the statue at the end of the walk down to Dolly Mount Strand a 70-foot-high Virgin Mary towering over the bay. Our Lady, star of the sea. I was on my third coffee, which wasn't helping the pace of my heartbeat. The paper cups stacked neatly on the ground beside me, and I was scrolling on my phone, dangling my legs above the water. Finn dropped down to the ground beside me. How long have you been here? he asked. Since half past twelve. A ferry rolled slowly out of the port at East Wall, and Finn and I watched it, this colossal monster of a thing sending waves washing towards the strip of land we sat on, under the feet of the Virgin Mary. Are you going to tell me what happened? He asked. I put down my phone and kicked out my legs. Softly I sang, happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me, Dina. Happy birthday, dear Dina, happy birthday to me. You cut class for the first time in your life, Finn said. You go dark online for the whole day until you ask me to meet you here. You're acting weird. Er, very ha. So either you're deciding to try out a bit of good old fashioned teenage rebellion on your 17th birthday, in which case I applaud you and wish you only the best, or, Finn paused for breath, or something happened today. The ferry picked up speed. So far, I said slowly, I think it's safe to say that this has been the worst birthday in the history of birthdays. Did something happen at school? I can't go back there, I told him. Ever, probably. Finn turned to look at me, his features blurry in my peripheral vision. I stared in silence through my glasses at the sea. Okay, he rubbed his hand twice over his close cropped head black hair. So what's the plan, he said. You go on the run? Get Rachel to homeschool you? Good luck with that. Three tears ran silently down my cheeks before I could stop them. I might not be able to go home either. Shit, said Finn. Come on, Dina, what happened? They had a vote at school. 
Of everything that had happened so far, that was easier to open with. What? Who had a vote? Is this about the talk they're protesting? No, I said, no, they had a vote about me. Finn shook his head. You're going to have to fill in the gaps for me here, Rice. I filled in the gaps. I started with school. I began to cry when I told him about my dad. By the time I'd got to Mandy's reaction, I was having trouble breathing. Finn put a careful arm around my shoulder. There were certain things that only my best friend could understand being by himself. He may not have completely understood why I was so terrified of my father finding out, seeing as how dad didn't even live with us. But Finn did understand not wanting to be out loudly and publicly at school. Only a small handful of his friends in class knew. Until this morning, I hadn't been out to anybody but Finn. When I had finished, he stood abruptly and said, that's it, I'm buying you a chocolate muffin and when you've eaten it, we're gonna get my cousin to buy us some cans. Screw those bitches in school and screw your whole damn family. It's your birthday. Tonight, we're gonna get drunk and talk about girls. He strode purposefully back to the little coffee shop by the car park, his hips lean in his grey uniform trousers, his head high. I understood why Rachel had always wanted me to end up with Finn, apart from the obvious fact that he was the only boy who'd ever shown interest in me, romantically or otherwise. Life would be so much simpler if I could just fall in love with my best friend. Above me, Our Lady Star of the Sea watched the fairy slide slowly out of sight. When I turned back round, ahead of me in the water there was a woman. Not a swimmer. Not somebody who jumped into the bay on a dare. An old woman, so pale her skin seemed grey, submerged past her mouth, her long silver hair tangling through the foam of the small waves around her. A woman with a ravaged skeletal face, cheeks sunken, eyes set deep in wrinkles, their irises as grey as her hair. She wasn't treading water. She wasn't moving at all. She was staring right at me, unblinking. A long grey hand came out of the water. Its twisted fingers beckoned. I couldn't explain what happened next, only that I must have started so hard I slipped off the rocks at the base of the statue and into the water. There was nobody close enough to push me. The woman was too far for me to have pulled. A split second and I went under. Not even enough time to feel real fear. Water whooshed around me, filled my ears with roaring and my mouth with salt. I kicked wildly towards the surface. When I came up, the woman's face was a hair's breadth from mine. She opened her mouth and screamed. I love that bit. I love it. I also think this whole, um, you know, the authenticity of the relationship between Dina and Phil, how relatable it is, how natural they are, how uh, I talk to my students a lot on the MA and UL about authentic dialogue. And that's what I point to, you know, your writing, and Helen's writing that kind of, you know, how you have really listened with the writerly ear to the way people really talk. And, you know, there's not a moment of woodenness or inauthenticity. It's just you hold us there and you keep us in the fictive dream. And I also adore the way, I don't, I don't know if I've seen it done so well anywhere, is this just this magical integration of the real, of the gritty, of the imaginative, of the magic, that it all just kind of seamlessly holds together, that we're not saying, okay, here we are now in the magic moment, and now here we are back in real. There's something just so fluid about that, and it seems to me, I mean, you did talk about drafting and redrafting, um, or, and we might mention, we might touch on that a little bit um, in a moment, but uh, it seems like you've, you know, it looks effortless, but it, I imagine it took a long time to make that look so, and uh, that knit up so well because there's this rhythm and there's this momentum and there's this natural organic evolution of the story that is is really really extraordinary thank you so much for reading that piece as well <laughs> helen what are you going to read for us and, and maybe give us a tiny bit of context for it as well for those new to your story so uh queen of coin and whispers is a young adult political fantasy novel and it's kind of like a fantasy of manners so it's more with uh, courty like an intrigue and politics and it is about Leah a newly crowned idealistic who falls for Zanya her new spy master who mm -hmm. takes the job to avenge her murdered father um it's kind of like my informal pitch is if you like the little finger and Tyrion bits of game of thrones but want more queer women involved and aren't too keen on the things that happen to women in that in that show so I'm going to read from the first chapter, which is in Leah's 
point of view. And uh, in this, she has she just learns that her uncle is dying, and she is the next in line to inherit the throne. And she has been waiting a really long time for him to finally die. The sheep were un un undeniably dead, dead. As I examined what the wolves had left behind and tried not to pa panic, new footsteps through the frozen. I rose, stiff with cold, as a sir servant hurried a rider towards me. The royal jewel was stitched onto his coat, but I focused on his sleeve. No purple black and a rider would race here in late winter for only one reason. The king wasn't dead, but he was dying. Uncle had been clean for months. The reports had buried, bleeding, vomiting, recovery, bleeding, vomiting. Still, he had lived, complained, and made life bearable for everyone. And now, my aunt had given me enough warning, at least. I'd worried that she wouldn't. Your, your Highness, the sir servant bowed and the rider sank to his knees, sweating, and held out a l l letter. I cracked the seal and tucked the smaller hidden note into my glove glove and scanned the e expected words. No longer eating, can't keep water down. Preparations are all underway. I'd waited years. I'd expected to feel delight, maybe even relief. My uncle was dying. The throne would finally be mine. Panic bristled in my throat again. I lowered the note. Father, please give me the courage to do this well. You've made a difficult journey, I told the writer. Please take the time to, 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 to regain your strength here. The pleasure is mine, your highness. The rider trembled as if the shadow of my uncle's impending death had hounded him north. He'd probably expected to meet me in the drawing room, not in a field examining slaughtered sheep. They left me, and I staggered towards a tree and leaned against the trunk. The bark pressed against my coat, reassuringly familiar. The air scraped my nose and throat as I took deep, shaky breaths. I fished the second note out of my glove. Matthias had written two words in a version of our childhood code. No delays. No delays. Our phrase for when uncle's death was imminent and I was to get down here now. Matthias hated that I went north every winter when uncle could no longer stand beside me. I was one of the few nobles who did. It's ridiculous, Fume. You're up there freezing and alone while the court gets drunk and eats too much. I'm with my people, I always replied. You're the heir. Your people are the entire, not just your estate tenants. We'd argued before I'd left court in late summer. If I said suspected correctly that uncle's health was beyond help and I should stay. Well, I didn't want to resemble a prince over the crown like a scavenger bird. The throne would be mine, whether or not I stayed in Arcala. I broke into, into a run, swearing under my breath and hurried back towards the manor. We'd have to go quickly. Uncle must have declined suddenly or Matthias would have sent more warning to prepare. I should have listened to him. As I approached, the doors leading to the gardens burst open. Mother rushed down the steps. Leah! The house staff were probably huddled at every window facing us. They'd all heard her in improper glee. I stopped, stayed silent. Everyone at the windows would slink away. Only the bravest would e eavesdrop. The sun was still pale. The garden still bright with winter roses. Everything looked the same as when I'd woken up. But nothing would be the, the same after this. Every like just hairs on the back of my neck every single time. It still takes my breath away. And this amazing pacing and this tension. And that you just builds and builds and builds and builds throughout the whole. I mean, 
you're just on the edge all of the time. What I love, Helen, is what you mentioned in the contextualization of that piece is that you have normalized women's empowerment and their agency in this story in a way that fantasy novels often don't give any room for. And I, I think that makes it really special and really important for people. I also love that she wants to be queen, that she's not like, it's not being thrust upon her. She's not this kind of passive, you know, sort of um, uh, cookie cutter figure that stands and gets dressed and gets the crown put on her. She is, she's waiting for this. She's been waiting for this all her life. She's been planning for it. So on one hand, she has really prepared herself and she kind of, she's, she's taught herself into the role and that comes out in the execution of her journey. But also she's making up a lot of things as she goes along in the way that we all do when, when we're in situations that we have maybe wanted, but then don't know what to do with. It's a bit like becoming a writer. Okay, now what do I do? I've been wanting this all my life, but like, how do I get, how do I get through this? So in a way, she, she really spoke to me um, in all sorts of ways. I think there's a real universality about her experience. And, oh, I just, it's, it's so exciting that this kind of writing is happening and these kind of books exist. Uh, and I say that to you both. Um, what I'd love to talk about a little bit, and we do have a little bit more time, is the whole writing process. So I don't want to pigeonhole what exactly you want to talk about in relation to that, because I know you probably answer lots of different questions. But let me just throw out a few of those dichotomies. Pleasure or pain, plotting or um, pantsing, as they say, <laughs> um, morning or night, uh, therapy or torture, um, starting or finishing you know where what are your sort of patterns how you write in small snacks or in big feasts you write every day or do you wait until you have a week to yourself and then just do a huge binge of writing how does it work for you maybe, maybe i'll start with maura first to give helen a breather after the reading and thank you again helen it was beautiful that's also one of my favorite first lines in fiction i'm just uh, like <laughs> it's just so good um writing process yeah um uh so definitely i'm not a plotter um i like to the way i usually put it to people is that um i'm not writing the story the story is writing itself through me which um sounds a bit sounds a bit strange but um when I start writing, I have no idea how it's going to end um, and things just surprise me. And so I like for what I'm writing right now, I'll come downstairs and I'll tell my housemate, oh, yeah, this random thing just kind of popped up uh, and in this book that I'm writing. And now I don't know what's going to happen with that or where it's going to go. But I guess I'll find out in like three to five working days. Um, and I it can be a bit. Uh, it means that my first drafts are particularly chaotic. Um, I know that first drafts, by definition, are rubbish. Everybody's are. That's just the way it is. They're perfect because they exist and you build around that. And I'm a firm believer in rubbish first drafts. Um, but mine are absolute chaos. Um, and you were talking about, you were asking about um, the sort of magic, uh, magic and realism uh, balance. Um, my first drafts are basically just magic <laughs> and and mood and and feeling and characters feeling really loudly at each other um and then after that my editors will usually um very kindly and politely ask the same question every time which is Moira how does this magic work um what, what are the structures can we make it make just a tiny bit more sense please um and that's what the subsequent drafts are about actually like making things make sense um but that's a little bit the way I live my life. <laughs> Things are chaotic and a little bit of a structure around it. Um, as regards um, morning or night or uh, binges of writing versus uh, being more structured. Like, again, I'm not a naturally structured person, but I have two kids, so I have no choice but to write when they're in school. <laughs> um, because having a week to myself is not a... Uh, thing that happens very often. Uh, so if I was waiting for that, I would not write books very often. <laughs> but um, but but like um, but there again, like for, there were times when I was writing all the bad apples. That's what I'm writing now, where I have just 
just gotten so deep into the telling of the story, um, getting, getting completely pulled along that I can't stop, that I've just pulled all my shades without realizing it. It's 6 a.m. and I suddenly look up and kind of, <laughs> I've got 5,000 words written <laughs> somehow in the last few hours. Um, so it's not a it's not a particularly structured or well thought out or um, uh, or planned thing. It's a lot more organic than that. <laughs> Oh, I'm afraid I've lost your audio. Sarah, we can't hear you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, that was fine. I, put, I turned off the sound because I didn't want to be interfering, and now I, I forget to put it back on again. It's, it's so fascinating to hear. I'm always amazed to hear people's writing process because everyone is slightly different. And as you say, constrained by life circumstances, but also by your own preferences. I've heard a few people recently, and it's kind of, a, I've tried to apply it to my own practice, who who are not natural planners, but who've decided for the next novel at this time, I'm going to bloody well plan it because it's, surely it's going to be easier. And the and the news flash is that it's not easier <laughs> because you still have to fill out all that colour and that mood and all that. You still need to do your draft zero at some point, even if you have a plan. And then when you've done that, the plan will often change. So in a way, I think we are what we are. I mean, I'm exactly like you, Maura. I start with the draft zero. And if I showed it to anybody, they would probably say, look, you, maybe you need to go and see somebody for your mental health, so like, because they would read it and say, this is absolutely crazy. And then for, I call it um, pulling the giant out of the soup. You know, from this, I just try to drag something that looks like it has a shape. And it takes me ages, and I don't think there's any other way for me to do it. And the way that you described it really reflects my experience. And I'm so envious of plotters, you know, who people who don't take pen to paper until they've got the whole thing thought out, but I just don't think I have it in me. Um, so yeah, so interesting. Helen, what's it like for you? Um, as I said earlier, I didn't plan Queen well, and it took me about two drafts to fix that. And Queen took me so long that I basically went, well, I can't spend six years writing a book because I, I will have written very few books if I keep doing this. So when I got the next book I was writing, which is the one I'm unofficially re re revising for Nano. I bought a book about structure and I bought the workbook that came with the book. So I didn't read all the book, but a big me me mess of of an outline, which was a lot of bullet points and notes to myself of my flash after. And I started doing a very small outline of like beats and dark moments and everything. And then for my next book, which is much more character driven and it's much more internal stakes, I just wrote I just vomited out a 2,500 word synopsis to myself and had down because obviously no one actually wants a synopsis that long. But it was just me telling myself the story, but in a way that I wouldn't then be bored if I actually had to sit down and write it. So I've become a planner because Queen was such an awful experience in the early drafts. Like I don't like drafting. Um, I like being able to fix things because I hate the gap between the book that's in your head and the book that's on the pip page. I don't like, especially I think because I'm often coming from a completed book, so I have that word count bar full, and then you're back to a very empty word count bar. And I usually pin mine around a hundred thousand if it's a second world fantasy, because that's the way for adult not so much, but for YA my experience has been that if you creep closer to 100,000 words, they start to get really, really nervous. So you have a 100,000 word empty word bar, and that's, that's a lot of words I have to write. Um, I could just go off and watch like Netflix for like hours. Like a lot of people go, I love writing and I and I do love it, but I like it when it's, when it's over, when I'm fixing the words. There's a lot of easier things I could be doing with my oh. time. I could be reading a book for fun. I like oh, reading for fun. Um, but then at one point when I was in a really stressful living situation, I could I thought it's too stressful to write. So I didn't write and I, I was miserable. So I, I, I side eye that whole like craft and muse talk, but I do realize when I'm not writing, I'm I'm not very happy, even if the book isn't going to be published, even if it needs another draft. Um, I'm very character driven more than plot driven driven like I joked I have to wrap a plot around the characters like if I could just write 60,000 words of them just sitting in a room having feelings at each other I'd have so much fun 
but not really what people want out of published books, so stop um, But, um, like, I knew there was stuff I hadn't been able to put in, so I did ask O'Brien, I went, look, I have these short, like, stories set before, and I wrote, can I write them, and we'll just give them to people for free. And if they take the next book, we don't know yet, it's still been this uh, the synopsis is going soon and the partial i'd like to do another set of short stories linking from queen to the time period in that book so it's just a way of doing those non really those things that don't really fit into a published book but are still fun for people to read about so yeah and like my writing process <sighs> i used to be that whole thing of get the first draft down and then fix it but it takes me so long to fix it that i went I don't have the time for this because I have a I have a day job. I have a day job, and with, so I have to write around that. And I just kind of went, well, maybe if I can learn to write a slightly cleaner first draft, uh, it'll probably be the same amount of time, but it'll feel less despairing. So I have made a conscious effort in the last two years to just try and draft clean, even though obviously it's not perfect because no draft's perfect, but just to not have to just rip 30,000 words out of the middle because they don't work and then you have to put new 30,000 words in and then wrap everything else you have in so that's the game just get a little bit better with each book book just try oh Helen that's my quest as well if you crack it please let me know <laughs> <laughs> and I do I, I, and I, I should say as well like if you're starting out crappy first draft is really important because learning to finish a book is a huge thing and it makes writing another one easier but I just want to make it a little bit easier for myself as well and I think that just comes with time well that re leads in really well to my uh, one of my final questions which is around that advice to writers because I know a lot of people are going to be tuning in who are writers or who want to be writers and are looking for advice and I suppose that's the first thing that I would again reiterate what Helen has just said you know, just allow yourself permission just to write crap because if you try to be perfect on the first, um, in your first efforts, it's just going to strangle you and paralyze you, and you know you won't find anything, um, because you'll be too worried and too judgmental about your own. That's why I think things like Nano Rimo are so great because they really do open the door and just let people lash it down. But if I was to ask both of you, if you were only allowed one to give one piece of advice to a new writer. Um, what out of all the bits of in, insight and wisdom you both have, what would you tell them? If you only had, you know, 30 seconds to give some advice, what would that be? Uh, maybe I'll go to Maura first and then Helen. I'm putting you on the spot, Maura. No, no, I, I think it would be about first drafts, to be honest. I think it would be not to compare your first draft to somebody else's final draft, because uh, every novel that has been published that you read has gone through so many drafts, has gone through like so many professional like editors, copy editors, agents, people who have looked over it. Um, so it has been read and reread and worked and reworked for several years. So it it would be to like um, like Helen, you were saying about um, the the frustration between how, the story that you have in your head and the story that you have on the paper, but that uh, that only exists within the first couple of drafts. So not to get discouraged at that point. Um, oh, because of that's my favorite piece of advice. It is my favorite piece of advice. You know, mm -hmm. don't compare your first draft. With, we only ever see other people's last drafts. We very rarely see early drafts. And lots of writers, up until quite recently, have been deathly silent about their process. They haven't given away the secrets that it actually starts out crap and ends up good. And that's such a, an important lesson for new writers to, to take on board. So thank you, Maura, for that. I think that really does matter to people. And I think new writers really need to hear that. How about you, Helen? There, I'm going to do one and a half. The first one is back up your work. I back it up oh, more than this. <laughs> you never know until until you've opened a draft and, and there's a lot of words missing. Um, especially for people starting out, I would say have fun. Like try to have fun. If you're not ready to do a book, write, you know, fanfic of a show. Like I did fanfic for 11 years and it taught me a lot about how to finish but also taught me like what makes a story enjoyable like i wrote queen for 16 year old me like i like i wanted to see a princess who was ready to be a queen i wanted her to be lesbian i wanted her to get the girl at the end but 
if you're not enjoying it, then readers probably aren't going to enjoy it. So, you know, even if it's a really short draft and it's just that you like, you can go back and then put in the actual like muscle that links it all together. But it's a long process. It's a lot of w w words and it, we really should be trying to make it as fun for ourselves because it is work, but it should be enjoyable work. Oh my gosh. I mean, that if honestly, if new writers just took those three things on board, back up your work. Remember your first draft is not like other people's last draft. So, you know, don't be a perfectionist. And the whole thing about just having fun, you know, enjoy it. Because what's the point? I mean, that's what creativity is. It's playfulness. It's making things up. It's getting back to, in many ways, our childlike selves and finding the joy in making up a story. And, and in that can be therapy, can be lessons, can be insights, can be big, grand ideas. But at the, at the center of it is story. And story is fun. You know, and we're, we're naturally um, uh, sort of designed to tell and to hear and to understand stories. And if we're not having fun doing that, then it really, maybe it's not for us, you know? So, um, but I do think as professional writers like you two are now, and as published writers, it's kind of easy for it to become another burden on your back and to re, for, for not just for new writers, but I think for established writers to reconnect with the reasons why we do it in the first place. It's, again, it's important to remind ourselves of all that, isn't it? or else uh, it can become very burdensome. Because as you both said, it's hard and it's torturous and it's a long, it takes a long time to do it. And um, so you need to keep the spark going. Uh, both of you, Maura and Helen, it's been an absolute delight talking to you. I was really nervous about how the online environment would work, but you guys have made it just so easy for me to ask you questions and you've talked so beautifully and you've read so beautifully from your work. And so for those um, viewers who are already fans of Helen and Maura, um, I'm sure it's been an absolute treat. And for those of you who are new to the writing of both Helen Corker and Corcoran and Maura Valley Doyle, please go out and buy uh, their books and read them and share them because uh, they are they have added wonderful stories and wonderful characters to um to, to what's out there and um, I couldn't recommend their books highly enough. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, well done. I hope next time we meet it will be over a perfect latte, Helen, somewhere in Dublin. <laughs> I really look forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. For, thank you. Thank you very much.